coming up. Tropical depression seven forms and could affect Antigua and Barbuda as a tropical storm. We're tracking what is forecast to become tropical storm grace. Health Ministry confirms presence of gamma variant of COVID-19. All four variants of concern have now been detected in the country. Veteran diplomat Sir Ronald Sanders calls for reasoned stance on COVID-19 vaccines as he raises grave concern over anti-vax campaigns. And a major move unveiled to improve the ease of doing business in Antigua and Barbuda. Those details start right now. The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. A very good Friday evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us for the evening news here on ABS and Tigas News Authority. My name is Garfield Burford. And I'm Sequoia Servia. Thank you for joining us. We begin with a developing story on the weather, as Antigua and Barbuda and the rest of the Leeward Islands are now bracing for the effects of a tropical, tropical cyclone this weekend. That's right, Sequoia. Increased rainfall and gusty winds are expected as the tropical disturbance heads toward the eastern Caribbean. The forecast is for it to develop in a tropical storm grace before impacting the Leeward Islands. Now joining us early in the broadcast is meteorologist Orvin Page. Good evening, Orvin. Uh, what's the very latest you can tell us about where this disturbance, well, where this tropical depression is now and when is it expected to begin affecting Antigua and Barbuda? Uh, Garfield and Sequoia and all of us, all of you joining us here at ABS Television, we are looking at an upgraded system at 5 p.m. this afternoon. We now have tropical depression number seven, approximately 673 miles to the east of Antigua and Barbuda, moving towards the west near 22 miles per hour with peak winds of 35 uh, miles per hour. Uh, this system is expected to move right over Antigua or near Antigua by just around 2 a.m. on Sunday morning, bringing with it uh, increased rainfall, possibly in excess of one to three inches, and bringing winds not really too much of a bother in terms of what we uh, are accustomed to with these uh, systems. We're looking at minimal winds just around 40 miles per hour or so, making it a minimal tropical storm. Uh, at this time, we are looking at uh, a passage, again, close to Antigua and Barbuda early Sunday, the most impact we're looking at right now is mainly from rainfall. Gafiel? Thank you so much, Orvin. And Sequoia. what level of damage could result from the winds that will be here um, by tomorrow? Well, for these kinds of winds, and the timeline is really for early on Sunday morning, that's when the system is likely to be close, if not right over us. And again, I stress based upon the latest information we have as at 5 p.m. this afternoon. So we have a tropical depression, it is likely to produce winds of the order of around 35 to 39 miles per hour and possibly gusting up to around 50 miles per hour or so. Rainfall in just about one to three inches can be expected as far as sea conditions are concerned. Seas will peak around six to nine feet and we ask in Mariners to stay in port late, uh, from late tomorrow afternoon, Saturday into Sunday. So as far as the timelines are concerned, expect the weather to turn towards the worst or at least begin to turn towards cloudy conditions by late tomorrow, Saturday, and into the evening hours, really peaking on Sunday, where most of the rainfall expected. Some flooding is likely, and so we want residents to begin to think about where they will likely spend uh, the time riding out the storm. The good news is that it's moving at 22 miles per hour, and so its impacts upon us were not likely to be as prolonged as if it was moving at a, far, uh, at a slow rate. Orvin, uh, I heard the term this evening or this early this afternoon that it might be one of those kind of impacts that will be disruptive as opposed to destructive. Would that be a fair assessment of it? Excellent assessment, Garfield. And for this reason, we're not asking persons to make any run on the supermarkets. We're not asking persons to make any extraordinary preparation. We're looking at a minimal tropical storm. The winds are not likely to be an issue. Rainfall will likely be the greater impacts here. 
of course in one person's too if you have tents and so forth that could be uh, easily removed and destroyed perhaps it's best to take those down but it is a very good uh, assessment uh, uh, Garfield we're looking more at disruption as opposed to destruction because the winds are not likely to be of the order to cause minimum or to cause excessive damage rainfall is the issue here especially with the system but let me also stress these are dynamic systems this is based on the most recent information we are continuing to update the systems uh, update the information as the system continues to move closer and granted we get information we will pass it on to you if it becomes a bit more dire we are ahead of the game at the Met Office and will ensure that you have good, uh, good information to guide decision making. But as it stands right now, we're looking more of a disruption on Sunday as opposed to destruction because the winds are not likely to be of the order to cause catastrophic damage. Thank you so much, Orvin, and we definitely look forward to your update later in the newscast Certainly. when the 8 p.m. bulletin is available. Certainly. Excellent. All right. Uh, so Orvin Page joining us a bit early in our newscast. Of course, he'll be back later with the 8 o'clock. And of course, here is, uh, we're also following Sequoia, the issue of what Nods has been saying. Uh, we'll be hearing from the Nods director, Fillmore Mullen, in a short while. But let's tell you about this one, because our news team went on the streets of the capital today to find out whether members of the public are, one, aware of, and two, monitoring the threat from the impending tropical storm. So I checked my galvanized. Uh, check the screws, uh, uh, tighten those that are slack, and, you know, just the, the basic thing. I would say yes, and of course, you know, with the, the food thing, <laughs> that also, um, you check your, your lamps with the kerosene and so on. Um, you seem like people forget about the lamp, the old time system, and that, that is still a reliable source. West Palm people, the people them down at West Palm, prepare yourself. Time down, they did really, really bad. Plenty of people mightn't face it that bad because the town them did about West Palm did bad. We did have to go for dinghy and them thing they forgot to save people. Fireman did have to come with fire truck for help save people and them thing there. So I didn't prepare anything. Um, basically, I, I don't prepare. I just I, I live day by day. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm not really into the preparation. You know. All the all the America call me. I tell me stomach come in 48 hours, so you don't know. I prepare yourself a stomach come. I want to ask God to keep the whole of Antigua and Barbados safe because having a storm is not easy and things are very tight right now money-wise and we can't afford it. So I think that is why God has been spared in us all this time along so that we didn't have nothing bad to blow down our houses or anything like that. All right, so the flavor there, Sequoia, of what uh, members of the public have been saying. They were talking with our Kim Emanuel Baird. Meanwhile, ABS has used our Stay Alert series to examine the country's preparedness for any severe weather event this hurricane season. And we continue our look with Fillmore Mullen, the director of the National Office of Disaster Services, who joins us live via Zoom. Good evening, Mr. Mullen. Thank you so much for joining us. Firstly, let me start off here. Are you satisfied with the level of preparation ahead of the impact of what is likely to be Tropical Storm Grace? Generally, yes. They are, you usually have a very small minority that wait until the last minute. However, we have appealed to them, and especially in, in situa the situation in Babido. I spoke to the district with us, a coordinator this afternoon, to indicate that there are still, I think, two families that live in tents. And so she has been in shock as exactly what to do come tomorrow to deal with that situation. But on a whole, across Antigua and Barbuda, generally, the early preparedness is usually um, well taken care of by the general population. Thank you so much, Mr. Mullen. Um, will any shelters be opened, and if so, how many? Uh, usually, depending on the, the you know, amount of rainfall, there are likely to be three or four shelters open, and these are predominantly in known flood-prone areas. Uh, the Bolands area, um, you have the Yorks community, and there are one or two others that we will look at based on the forecast as it gets closer. Do you have any concerns at this point, Mr. Mullen? As we were showing our viewers a while ago some of the, some file footage of some earlier pictures we got of some of the shelters generally in the area, St. John's area, are you concerned about any particular thing that you want to point out now? Well, 
there, there is usually an argument to be made, whether, it, whether or not it's justified. It's something that we're all aware of, that the, the facilities that are used as shelters are not really purpose-built. And there, there, there are many models, like the ones we have in Antigua, where uh, existing facilities are, are transformed into shelters when there is a threat or when there is an impact. But then after the impact, another assessment is made and facilities that can be used for longer term are then brought into the game. Um, but based on what we have and the numbers, I am pretty satisfied with what we have. Mm. And generally, last uh, point, Mr. Mullen, what would be your message to the public at this point? Uh, when, when, when you have a system developing, especially around the vicinity that this one is, there's always that outside chance that it could slow down and build up, or it could speed up and get here a little bit. Better. So people need to continue to monitor the information coming out of the Met Office and be prepared to take the necessary actions if required. All right, Mr. Mullen, thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us with those details. Fillmore Mullen, as we said, is director of the National Office of Disaster Services. You'll be keeping us abreast of these situations and uh, as we continue to monitor this very closely. Thanks so much. Yeah. All right, Fillmore Mullen. As we've been reminding you uh, for the past several weeks, you need to stay alert. Well, here's another developing story this evening. The health ministry has now confirmed the presence of the gamma variant of COVID-19 in Antigua and Barbuda. The ministry says the gamma variant was confirmed in three of eight samples taken between the 18th and 22nd of July and sent to the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA, for genomic sequencing. The other five samples were confirmed as a Delta variant. Well, this means all four variants of concern have now been detected in the Twin Island state in recent months. Now, these are the Alpha variant, first identified in the United Kingdom, the Beta variant, first identified in South Africa, the Gamma, as we've been mentioning, first detected in Brazil, and the Delta variant, first identified so now, in India. Uh, the Delta variant had first been identified in one of seven samples taken between May 5th and July 2nd. Like the Delta variant, the Gamma variant is also more transmissible than the original and causes more severe disease, resulting in increased hospitalization and death. All right, for more on this, we're unpacking all these developments uh, this evening. We're now joined by the head of the laboratory at the Celeste Bird Mount St. John's Medical Center and the chairman of the National Technical Working Group on Vaccines, Dr. Lester Simon, who joins us on Zoom. Good evening, Dr. Simon. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let me start off here. Now, what, are, what more can you tell us about the individuals infected with these variants, that is the gamma and delta variants from these eight samples, are they locally or they local or imported cases, and are they in hospital? Uh, they are both local and imported, but in terms of hospitalization, unfortunately, I don't have that information. But they are both local cases as well as imported cases. And um, the other information I can give you is that we had additional reports after the one report that was uh, published today. But before we get to the new report to add it on to what you already know, um, suffice to say from the 29th of October last year, which is when we started sending samples for sequencing um, at CAFO, up until the report you mentioned, we had just about 32 samples um, that were perfectly um, sequenced. I said perfectly because there are some imperfection even in the sequencing. Um, procedure, which we could talk about a little later if you have the time. Of those 32, um, it's probably best to talk in percentage term. 60% um, of those, 19 of them, were actually the alpha variant. And 25% of them, eight of them, were in fact the delta variant. And 3%, sorry, 9% or three of them were the gamma variant. And two of them or 6% were in fact the, the beta variant. Now, what's of interest here is that of all these samples that have been sent in for sequencing, you will notice that we have not mentioned the wild type. And it begs the question whether the wild type, the original manifestation of the virus, has in fact been replaced, as has happened in many countries, including the Caribbean. For example, in Barbados, the, the um, alpha variant has replaced the, the, um, the wild type. And I suspect that is what is happening here. Um, because we have not picked up any alpha variant in the results we have sent to CAFA, although there is a bias in some of the samples we sent, which we could talk about some other time. Um, but th that was, those 32 that we had, which were included um, 
in, in the report that was published today. There have been some more reports after this, or an additional report after that. We had 10 more samples, 10 more reports. And of the 10 more, surprise, surprise, nine out of those 10 are Delta variants, and just one is Alpha. So we move from 32 to 42, and of that 42, 20 of them, as we had 19 for the Alpha, now one more, 20 of them are Alpha, which makes about 48%, and 17 out of the 42, which is about 40%, are the Delta variant. The Gamma still remains 7%, and the, um, the beta still remains two. But what's of interest as well is that two of the reports we got from CAFA said we are virtually certain that these two are beta, sorry, are delta variants, but we cannot be 100% certain. We are literally 99% certain. So if we were to add those two, it means instead of 17 um, delta, we actually have 19. And instead of 42, we have 44. And the percentage between alpha, which I think is a dominant strain in Antigua now, and the delta, the alpha is in fact 45%, and the delta is 43%. The delta is trying, and it's probably going to succeed in overtaking the alpha, as in fact I think the alpha has overtaken the original white type. So that, that's where we are as far as the numbers are concerned. Mm. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. Another quick question. Out of the first set of samples that were sent to CARFA, how many of these, how many of these patients were vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Fortunately, I don't, I don't have that figure. Those are data that, that we're working with. Mm -hmm. Suffice to say, the general information is those who are vaccinated, uh, once, you get, once you're vaccinated, even if you end up with breakthrough COVID, you have... I won't say I have nothing to worry about, but your symptoms are extremely mild to non-existent compared to the ones who are not vaccinated. Um, but I have to tell you that all of that data is being compiled along with some other more, some other important information regarding contact tracing, and in due time we'll come to you with that, that composite set of uh, um, information that you obviously um, need to have. Thank you, Dr. Simon. And do you have any other demographics as to the age of these um, COVID patients? The age ranges? No, I, I, I don't have that, but it, the age is, is, is runs the full gamut from, you know, from teenagers all the way up into 60s and 70s. There, there's, no, there's no exclusion here. Um, there, there is some talk about the, 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 um, the Delta um, affecting children a little bit more, um, but I think it's just part of the infectious nature of the Delta variant, of why, why, um, why, why this is in fact happening. Uh, I think the more important point to, to underscore about the Delta variant is that as bad as it is, and it's been dubbed as the fastest, quickest, baddest variant out there, it has this, this subtle way of doing things at the same time, if you can appreciate something being bad and awful and being subtle, in the sense that um, your symptoms may be just like a, a running nose, just like you have the, the flu. And in that way, it means this puts us in a lot of problems because we have to be on the alert now. For any little respiratory tract type infection, you have to ask yourself, is this in fact um, uh, um, um, a Delta? But more important than that, we have to be concerned about what's to come. Because as the variants on the go um, changes, as, they, as they're born, as they grow up, as our Deputy um, 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 Chairman Dr. Lewis uh, um, said, they undergo all this uh, mutation to the extent, which is what they do, which is why they become variant. And what we're concerned about, one, are, we, are they going to reach to a point where you have what is called immune escape? The antibodies that were make, made to whatever you know, the wild type was or whatever the virus was at the time, whether those antibodies will be able to protect us against, um, against new variants. And um, whether, in fact, we'll have to be going back to the manufacturers to, to get vaccines you know, relatively often. Yes, uh, and it, it <laughs> which brings up a crucial point because people are saying you know these vaccines are good because they're made so so quickly so fast. But guess what? People are going to be begging for vaccines to be made quickly if in, if uh, if at all these variants get get out of hand and change so much that we have to go back to the manufacturer relatively often to get vaccines to meet the the change in in, in the variant. That's a frightening thought, Dr. Dr. Simon. Let me ask you a final question. We have about a minute left in this segment, Dr. Simon. So there are individuals who are unvaccinated and who've indicated that they don't think they need to get vaccinated. Now, in light of how easily transmissible, far more transmissible are these variants of concern like gamma and delta, 
What will be your message to individuals who say they don't think they need to get vaccinated at this point? Well, it's a mixed message, really, because quite frankly, those who are willing to listen, those who are fearful, those who are concerned, genuinely concerned, we are talking to them, and we're going to move our discussion to a more interpersonal approach rather than trying to fight, you know, to take the fight uh, on a, a mass media. Um, but to those who are recalcitrant, those who just don't want to change, it's a rather remarkable thing because they know that the vaccine works. How do we know this? Because they come up with this beautiful analogy. They're, they're saying, or oh, this beautiful story, they're saying we the unvaccinated are actually worse off than you the vaccinated because while it is true, they didn't admit that, but I'll put it in, while it is true, the vaccinated, the unvaccinated can spread COVID to the vaccinated. They're saying, well, when that happens, guess what? You are vaccinated, so you're well protected. Nothing much is going to happen to you. But when we, the unvaccinated, get COVID from you, the vaccinated, I know that it shouldn't happen that much because of what the vaccine does, they're making the point that we, the unvaccinated are going to be worse off because we have no protection. You know what that means? It means that they are fully and totally aware that the vaccine works. That is what they're saying. All they're saying as well is that it works, but we are not going to take it. To those people, I have nothing to say other than good night. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lester Simon. Uh, really appreciate you joining us. I uh, know that you have, you have an extraordinarily busy schedule. Thank you so much for unpacking those details. We'll certainly follow up with you as well. Dr. Lester Simon, who is the chairman of the National Technical Working Group on Vaccines, also the head of the laboratory at the Sir Lester Bird Mount St. John's Medical Center. Giving us an update there, as the country has now confirmed all four variants of concern of the COVID-19 vaccine. Oh, sorry, the COVID-19 virus. All right, let's move on to another story that we're tracking as well. The government has responded to questions on whether it is making any change to the curfew restrictions amidst the uptick in cases. So for now, uh, the curfew conditions will remain from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. daily. Well, Information Minister Honorable Melford Nicholas makes it clear, though, the situation is being monitored closely. We have maintained status quo at this stage, uh, but it is a matter that will come up for review. Um, if the numbers tick to a level where tick out of control, where what we feel is necessary to break up any further spread of COVID in the communities. People fully vaccinated against COVID-19 are being told to continue adhering to public health and safety measures. The World Health Organization says even with high efficacy rates of the vaccines, every line of defense against COVID-19 transmissibility needs to be maintained. We're seeing more cases of breakthrough disease in part um, because people are stopping the other interventions that reduce the transmission of this virus. Um, so when the virus starts to transmit at a greater and greater pace and with greater frequency, there's a lot more exposure that everybody has, including people who are vaccinated. For those relying fully on their inoculation status, there is this reminder that no vaccines for any illness is 100% effective. Vaccines that we have against COVID are incredibly effective vaccines and people have seen the results from the clinical trials of, um, you know, in anywhere in the 80% range, 90% range um, of efficacy. Um, but that doesn't mean that 100% of people, 100% of the time are going to be protected against disease. There is no vaccine that provides that level of protection for any disease. The WHO official responds to those who question the necessity of getting vaccinated if they can still contract and transmit the disease. If you happen to get infected, um, the amount of virus that you have in your nose, in the back of your throat, that you're shedding and, and potentially transmitting to somebody is less of the virus. It's, there's less density of the virus in you um, and so less risk that you transmit it to somebody else. More news about vaccination because Albert Balthazar, the final winner in the government's cash for vax incentive, has received his check for $5,000. On behalf of the government of Antigua and Barbuda, it is my pleasure to present this check to Mr. Albert Balthazar, our final winner in the weekly vaccination incentive raffle. 
Members of the public are reminded that they can access COVID-19 vaccination between 9 and 3 tomorrow. That's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. tomorrow at the All Saints and Clare Hall Health Centers, as well as the Multipurpose Cultural and Exhibition Center. Villa Polyclinic and the Multipurpose Cultural Center are open Mondays to Fridays from 9 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. Antigua and Barbuda's ambassador to the United States, Sir Ronald Sanders, is calling for members of the public to take a rational stance on COVID-19 vaccines. The veteran diplomat asks the questions whether people across the Caribbean are being architects of their own destruction by latching on to anti-vaccination campaigns. Sir Ronald spoke exclusively with ABS News from Washington, D.C. today. Sir Ronald's latest article responds to the anti-vaccination rhetoric pervading many Caribbean societies. However, he says the economies of these countries, many of them tourism dependent, can least afford to prolong the pain of the pandemic. He puts it in stark terms. If we do not open up the economy of Antigua, and if other countries in the Caribbean do not open up their economies, we are not going to improve employment. Employment which is now low will continue to be low and it will get worse. How long do you think governments that do not earn revenue can continue to pay public servants and pensions? The money has to come in for the government to be able to pay. Meanwhile, he also makes it clear the more unvaccinated people there are in the population, the more the virus will spread and the more the health systems will be strained. Sir Ronald makes it clear people who get sick from other diseases would also be at risk of not getting the care they need because those resources have to be used to care for COVID patients. He says some individuals prey on the fears of others with thinly veiled ulterior motives. Sir Ronald says information and reasoned positions are the antidote of fear, as he told me about what led him to get the COVID-19 vaccine. I knew that if I got COVID, my diabetic situation with COVID could probably put me in a grave. And I decided that it is far better to take the vaccine than to catch COVID, which I knew would kill me than to take the vaccine which gave me an opportunity to live. Now, that was my calculation. I took the AstraZeneca, I had two shots of it, I had no side effects whatsoever. He says while it is unclear who is behind these anti-vaccination campaigns, opposition political parties and even criminal elements in some countries across the region have taken advantage of the situation. In every situation, we have to ask ourselves who benefits from the action that is being taken. Who benefits from mass protests? Who benefits from confrontations with the police? Who benefits from the instability uh, that comes out of that and the civil unrest and the disturbance? Somebody who likes that atmosphere in which to thrive. And I don't think we have to think too far. He says it is myopic for political parties in opposition to use these anti-vaccination campaigns to try to oust incumbent governments because that would be a pyrrhic victory, one gained at too high a cost as to be considered a victory. What is the point of, of making people demonstrate against the vaccination? You use COVID as a political tool. You demonstrate, you, you may even succeed in getting people to bring governments down. And then you have the job. What are you going to do? Are you going to tell them they mustn't be vaccinated, that you're quite happy to have COVID running rampant in the country? Of course they're not going to do that. Uh, because they can't do that. The country cannot, no country can grow on the basis of, of being infect, infected by COVID-19 and no effort to vaccinate people to stop it. Because that's the only thing that will stop it eventually. Well, let's stay with news from Sir Ronald Sanders because he continues to pay tr glowing tribute to the late national hero and former Prime Minister Sir Lester Bryant Burr. The veteran diplomat says the country suffered a huge loss when Sir Lester died on Monday as he recalled Sir Lester's visionary and pioneering work in several areas, including tourism. He set about it with the help of, of others, uh, principally Hugh Marshall Sr., uh, who was uh, in the ministry with him. Uh, I joined them uh, in 1977, and uh, and you know he that all of that began to be built. Uh, I must say, Lester traversed the world, uh, trying to get tourism moving in Antigua. The success of what we have today is largely due to him. 
So Ronald says Sir Leicester was one of the first voices on the international stage to champion the interests of small states and to stand against marginalization. When incidentally we took the case against the United States uh, at the World Trade Organization, if it were not for Leicester's courage, it wouldn't have happened. Because there were many who were saying that Antigua can't take on the United States. Well, Leicester felt that if Antigua's interest was at stake, we'd take on anybody. In this ABS News follow-up, the Antigua and Barbuda Defense Force Coast Guard search for missing fishermen Lester Small and Leon Sears remains on suspension. Small and Sears were last seen on June 23rd as they ventured out on a 23-foot Pyrook fishing vessel en route to Ashton Bank. The investigation was suspended a week later as the Coast Guard sought for the information. A fuel tank belonging to the vessel was discovered on Sunday, July 4th. However, ABDF Lieutenant Commander Elroy Skerritt says no other leads have since been materialized. Stay with us. More of the stories that we're tracking for you still to come, including this one. There is a major step to improve the ease of doing business in Antigua and Barbuda. We'll tell you about that one. Plus, later, local authorities provide an update on their efforts to keep African swine fever at bay. Upcoming on the ABC Evening News, on air and online. Please stay with us, please. At Nagico, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like your boat when you're at sea and you get away from everything. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. And the car that you've had for too long. But after all these years, you just can't let go. At Nagico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. Good morning, Mrs. Philip. I have some meal here for you. Good morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Honey, those LED bulbs that you got from Quality Electrical are really working wonders. Look at how low the bill is. Really? That's what I'm talking about. Need LED bulbs, conduits, switches, fans, light fixtures, generators, meters, breaker panels, electrical tools, or plumbing fittings? Well, we've got them all and so much more. We also offer home automation, installations, and maintenance. Put your mind at ease by letting us do the work for you. Wait, babe, is that the mailman coming to our house? Uh, yeah, it looks so. Drive, drive, drive! So stop running from the mailman and head over to Quality Electrical Sales and Services Limited on Hawkins Drive and in Jolly Harbor or call us at 463-2118. The number one stop for all your electrical needs. So check it. Flo is giving away $30,000 in cash. Each Friday, two people will win $1,000 each. Now hear this. Two lucky grand prize winners will also each get $10,000. Okay, so how do you get to win these prizes? It's simple. Sign up for a new Flex postpaid plan, activate an always-on prepaid plan, pay your bill in full and on time, and win. Get a new Flex postpaid plan, activate an always-on prepaid plan, pay your bill in full and on time, and win. Flow terms and conditions apply. Hi, I'm Karen, General Manager of Caribbean Union Bank. We can certainly learn a few lessons over this last year. Our homes became offices, classrooms, restaurants, farms. Let's just say everything. We've learned to treasure home. And that is why CUB is excited to present Everything is Home, our loan and deposit initiative. As your homegrown bank, we want you to own your future. Whether it's to build or buy a new home, renovate, invest in land, or boost your saving towards these goals, count on us to give you the right information to make the right choice. Come to CUB, where everything is home. We welcome you back this evening with a developing story about an initiative set to make doing business easier in this country. The Development Control Authority, the DCA, is implementing an online one-stop shop to make it easier for people to apply for construction permits. As we hear from Jamie J. Roche. 
With the click of just a few buttons, architects, engineers, draftsmen, just about anyone, were able to apply to the DCA for construction permit. This is because the DCA is taking the process online with a one-stop shop portal. Based on a project's location, several agencies must sign off before the authority can approve a construction permit. It says this can take 144 days as the agencies pass the application among one another. The DCA connected with Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility to set up the online portal. CCPF has managed and helped fund the project for the past three years. Project lead Kieran Swift says the portal will make the DCA's work more efficient. You have fewer steps involved and some of those steps now run in parallel. So for example, multiple agencies can review uh, development plans and construction plans at the same time. Applicants will be able to pay fees and monitor their application's progress online. CCPF symbolically handed the lead over to the DCA Friday. From this point on, what we want to do is start a pilot, start off with a pilot project where we will engage uh, a few persons from the public, mainly um, persons from the Architects Association, the Construction Association and the Engineers Association to engage with us in a period of um, trial and testing. The Information Technology Ministry has worked with software developer iOS partners to train workers at DCA and the other agencies to use the software. What is taking place at the DCA today is a small subset of a much larger, uh, bigger process of transformation that is taking place in the government of Antigua and Barbuda. The portal's other benefits include reducing the application process by 50%, reducing paperwork by 90% and increasing building code and guidelines compliance. The DCA also hopes to improve record keeping and collect vital data. The portal will go live to the public once the pilot phase is completed. Jimmy J. Roche, ABS News. Local authorities have been working feverishly to keep the African swine fever at bay. Recently resurfacing in, resurfacing in the Dominican Republic, the disease has the potential to decimate pig populations as its fatality rate is near 100%. In addition to regional efforts, veterinary officer within the Veterinary and Livestock Division, Dr. Nicole Hall James, describes the local measures which have been taken so far. Nationally, we, the, we in the Ministry of Agriculture would have called an emergency meeting at the beginning of the week with some of our other ministry stakeholders. So we would have had a meeting with the permanent secretaries from the ministries of health, um, justice, trade, immigration. Our chief public health inspector would have been involved so that we were all able to get on the same page as to how we're going to need to work together to ensure this disease does not enter the country. Still to come, we'll we turn our attention to news overseas after the break. One of the stories that we're tracking closely, Barbados hoteliers stand firm on regular testing of unvaccinated tourism employees. And in international news, Britain rocked by its worst mass shooting since 2010. Five are killed. We'll tell you about those stories upcoming on the ABC Evening News, on air and online. Do stay with us, please.